we are going to discuss the Declaration of Independence, a document that every American citizen should try to understand, and one that, like other great works, should be read carefully and discussed thoroughly in every school in this country. We will not be able to cover the whole Declaration of Independence, though it's only two pages long. It is too much to discuss thoroughly in two hours. We will spend a few moments on the opening paragraph, a few moments on the closing paragraph, and then we will devote all the rest of our time to the first five lines of the second paragraph, beginning with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and so on. In those lines, almost every word counts, and that is why we should pay very close attention to all the important words. It will take us the better part of two hours to achieve a clear understanding of these ideas. To do so will require all of us to use words with maximum precision. That is difficult to do, and most people, most students, are not accustomed to doing it. In the questions I ask you, I will try to be as precise as possible in my use of words, and I will try to get you to be precise also in your use of words so that we can achieve a clear understanding of the ideas expressed by those words. That is a very instructive exercise, and the Declaration of Independence is an ideal text to perform that exercise on. In the course of the discussion, difficult questions will confront us to which none of us will know the answer. That is fine. Such questions are good questions, so they keep our minds actively engaged in the pursuit of answers. In this case, a close analytical examination of a very rich, a very significant, and a very difficult text. The Declaration, as you know, was signed and promulgated on the 4th of July. You all know that, 1776. But what you might forget is that in, a little earlier, in, in June or <coughs> late May of 1775, the colonists were in battle with the redcoats of King George III, and they fought a battle at Concord Bridge. So the war, the war between the colonists on this side of the Atlantic and Great Britain, the king's troops, had begun almost a year before the Declaration uh, was pub published. That war, in the history books that you've read, or other history books that you may not have read, sometimes carries this one of four names. It is sometimes called the Revolutionary War. It is sometimes called the War of Rebellion. It is sometimes called the War of Independence. It is sometimes called the War of Secession. I repeat those four. Revolutionary War, War of Rebellion, War of Independence, War of Secession. Please look at the first paragraph while I read it to you, that first paragraph, <coughs> because what I want you to tell me as I read it in the light of the words of that paragraph, as you look at the words carefully in that first paragraph, which do you think is the best of those four names, the most appropriate name for the war that was going on? When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Of those four names, which do you think is the right name for the war, in the light of that paragraph, I think? War of Secession. War of Secession. What you, what's your answer, uh, uh, Dan? Uh, war of Secession. War of Secession. Uh, what's your answer? War of Secession. Uh, uh, has any, war of Secession seems to have the most votes so far. Has anyone any other name to defend? <coughs> yes? War of Rebellion. War of Rebellion, you think? Yes, uh, Tim? War of Independence. War of Independence. Would anyone call it a Revolutionary War? That's, that's, by the way, that's the name that usually, in almost all history books, there are even titles, The History of the Revolutionary War. <coughs> Tell me why, uh, coming back to you, uh, Darrell, why did you think War of <coughs> Secession was the right name? Well, it talks about dissolving the political bands. Hmm and then um, impelling them into the separation. Separation. That was your reason also, I, I take it. Uh, that, by the way, Tim would just as easily justify a war of independence, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
does anyone disagree, we didn't spend much more time on this, does anyone disagree that either of those two names, War of Independence or War of Secession, are better names for the war than Revolutionary War or War, war of Rebellion? Would anyone like to defend those words? Well, that's, that, that's good. And that leads to another question. You all know about the French Revolution, which took place in uh, 1789. Uh, you all know about the Russian Revolution that took place in 1917. How does the American Revolution, often called that, differ very strikingly from the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution? Yes. Uh, With the uh, American Revolution, it was more of not a change of, of the way of life. It was that uh, England had granted rights to all its citizens and then denied it some of those rights to those in the to the people living in the colonies. With the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, it was a complete change of the class system and the way of life in those Duffy? countries. The Duffy? French and Russian Revolution happened within the country, and the English Revolution, it wasn't an English Revolution happening in England, it was a colony revolution. So that's why I wouldn't really. Yeah. <coughs> Jim? The American colonists didn't try to change the government of England, they tried to separate themselves, themselves. independent. That's right. In the case of the French Revolution, they threw out the king. Right. In the case of the Russian Revolution, they threw out the czar. Well, we didn't Americans. throw out uh, George III. We separated <coughs> ourselves. We had independent status. That's very good indeed. Now then, take the text, beginning with the words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And now I'd like to, with your help, examine it word by word, because it's just as weighty and fruitful as that. We hold these truths. The first word that stops us is the word truth. <coughs> You all use it every day in your life. You say true, you say false. Laura, make a statement right now that everyone around the table will know immediately is false. Everybody in this room is over 18. You all agree that she's made a statement. Why, what makes that false? Because everybody in this room is not over right. 18. Then if you now make a true statement. Everybody in this room is of varying ages. What makes that true? Go ahead. Hard to do. It's perfectly obvious, but to make the make the obvious because point. Because everybody in this age is of varying ages. Yeah, there's some over twenty, over eighteen, some under eighteen. <coughs> now, do you see? By, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever told a lie, Buffy? <laughs> how, do you tell, <laughs> how do you tell a lie? Um, what is involved in telling a lie? Which is deception. the Deception. What me? Deception. Right? No, no. How do you tell a lie? Oh, you don't tell the truth. How do you, you make something up. No, no. You, you have to answer the question a little more precisely. When you tell your lie, when you tell a lie, what are you saying to somebody else? You want me to give me an example? No, don't tell me a lie. Just tell me what you do. What you, <coughs> how, yeah, yes. A statement that is not true. A statement uh, of facts. No. And no. untrue. Well, of course, obviously, when you tell a lie, <laughs> you're making a statement. In fact, it may be true, but you think it's not true. What is, what is the relation between what you say in speech and what you think when you tell a lie? Yes? You know the truth, but you tell them something different. You th when you tell, whenever you tell a lie, you say something verbally which you think is the, is, the, which is the opposite of what you think is true. If you happen to think, uh, Laura, that it's raining out now, mm -hmm. and you said to all of us, it's bright, clear, sunny day, you'd be telling a lie even though it's not raining out now because you mistakenly think it is raining out now, and you say the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So telling a lie, telling a lie consists in saying the opposite of what you think is true. <coughs> and speaking the truth is saying the way, saying something which agrees with the way things are. Now that, I have to tell you because it's a wonderful statement, Aristotle many centuries ago, in one sentence, defined truth and falsity. He says, we think truly when we think that that which is, is, and that that which is not, is not. We think falsely when we think that that which is, is not, and that that which is not, is. That, that simple sentence indicates that when your thinking agrees with the way things are, you think truly. When your thinking disagrees with the way things are, you think falsely. And all connecting those words is and is not. So we go on to the next as we now know what, what truth is. But the next one is a little more difficult. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Tim, what <coughs> makes a truth self-evident? Self-evident truth is something that is obviously true to everyone. 
obviously true to everyone. Like a self-evident, well, an example of a self-evident truth is that all of us around this table are male or female. Um, I think that's a, 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 not a good example of self-evident truth, though it is something we obviously all agree about. Tell me a little more about what you, you think it's sufficient to say that a self-evident truth is one, suppose for a moment that someone said, I don't agree with that. There are some people around the table that are neuter. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it isn't. It's, it's possible to think that. Yes. Self, ex, well, self-evident truth would be Laura's wearing a purple shirt. No, oh, that's obvious. Uh, see, I, you see, the, 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 point, the point I want to make is that uh, it's perfectly evident. Hear me while we, it is perfectly <clears throat> evident to my perception as well as to yours but, that but, Laura's wearing, but evident is not the same as self-evident. That's an evident oh, okay. truth. Okay, I, see. I asked you what a self-evident truth was. Mm. Uh, anyone? Anyone? By the, have, one question. Have you all studied geometry? Yes. All. In the geometry course you studied in high school, did you meet up with the distinction between axioms and postulates? Ever heard of that distinction? Yes. Heard yeah, well, yes, yes, I've heard, I've heard of it. What is an axiom? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard I, of it. I tutor geometry and still don't know. <laughs> do you, is it, let me be sure of that. No one around this table knows that you all studied geometry, you all passed the course, <laughs> and none of you know the distinction between axioms and, and, and postulates? I think yes? I do. Isn't an axiom something you accept as true and you just don't question it? And, and the, the postulates postulate? are based upon the axioms? No. Postulates, in fact, postulates. It's, uh, postulates. are based so upon proofs. So. In fact, it's the other way around. Postulates is something which you voluntarily accept as true even if you can't prove it. In Euclid, every one of the postulates begin with the words, let it be granted that or please grant me that. Will you assume with me that? That's a postulate. Now, what's an axiom as opposed to a postulate? Something that's been proved. What? Something that's been The very proved. opposite of that, Greg. An axiom is a self-evident truth, and a self-evident truth is one that can't be proved because it's self-evident. If it were not self-evident, it could be proved. What is provable is not self-evident. What is self-evident is not demonstrable. Let me... Did any of you in the course of studying geometry ever hear that the whole is greater than the, any of its parts? That the par part is always less than the whole? You, you remember that, don't you? Yes. Well, now that's an axiom. That's one of the axioms of Euclid. And it's a self-evident truth. And the reason why, I'm going to test you out on this, the reason why it's a self-evident truth is that you cannot possibly think the opposite. Now, just try it for a moment. Just try it for a moment. Try to think that, think of a, uh, I'll do it very simply. Take a piece of paper. This is a, a whole piece of paper here. That's a hole. And I'm going to, and here are the four parts. That's all you have to do. Is it possible for you to, is it possible for you to think that the, any one of the parts is more than the whole? Can you think it? Can you think that the whole is less than one of its parts? I can't think the opposite of that this part is more than that whole, or this whole is less than one of those parts. Is that clear now what a self-evident truth is? A truth, the opposite of which it is impossible to think. Let me give you another example, so that you, one that you have never heard before. You all know what a triangle is, don't you? A three-sided figure. You know what a square is? Four-sided figure. You know, you know what a diagonal is? It's a line that connects the non-adjacent angles, <coughs> therefore in a square, if you draw the line that connects the non-adjacent angles, just to visualize this, you have two diagonals in a square, correct? A diagonal, a diagonal is a line that connects the non-adjacent angles in a plane figure. A triangle is a three-sided figure it therefore has no non-adjacent angles. It is therefore self-evident that there cannot be any diagonals in a triangle. Correct? Yes. You can't think of a triangle as having diagonals because of what you understand a diagonal to be and what you understand a triangle to be. Is that clear? There's just strikes you. You can't think the opposite. Now then let's go back to Jefferson. He says, <coughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, a hard question. I will tell you at once, that is not self-evident. You will tell me, if you can, what one word in that statement makes it not self-evident? 
It could become self-evident if we drop that one word out. What is the one word you must drop out to make it self-evident? Yes? Equal. Equal. Uh, created. Yes. Created. Why, why, why we must drop the word, not equal, we lose the sentence entirely. But why must we drop the word created out? Please, Alan, if you can explain it. Because all men aren't created, they aren't born equal. Some are missing legs, some are missing eyes, etc., etc. I mean, that's just an easy thing for people to see. So it's not self-evident because you could think. But that isn't the reason. That isn't the reason? That isn't the reason why you dropped the word created. Because The reason why you dropped the word created is because it is not self-evident that God exists. It is not self-evident that God exists. If it is not self-evident, not self-evident, you can think, you can, atheists exist who think that God does not exist. It is possible for human beings to think that God does not exist. It has nothing to do with the truth now. It's possible to think the opposite. If it is possible to think the opposite, that God does not exist, it is also possible to think that men were not created. Hence, you've got to drop the word created out if you are going to make the sentence true. Self-evident. Now, let's drop it out for a moment. Suppose I now substitute for the words word created a word that makes it self-evident. All men, I'm now, re -re I'm now rewriting Jefferson, self-evident that all men are by nature equal. <coughs> Before you think of that, I want you to tell me what the word equal means. Now, that's how you all use the word equal and unequal all every day of your life, but you must tell me in so many words when two things are equal and when two things are not equal. Let, let me give, take an example, very simple. This pointer and that pen are unequal in length, are they not? What makes them unequal in length? Our measures are different. I oh, have to say something more than that. What, what does their inequality in length consist in? What makes them unequal? They are, they're not equal. I remember, notice what I said. They are unequal in one respect, namely the respect of length. What makes them unequal? One is longer than the other. One is longer than the other. One is, is more and the other is less. <laughs> than length, correct? It's as simple as that. <laughs> now then, if, if two things are unequal, like follow now, if two things are unequal in the given respect, when one is more and one is less in that respect, when are two things equal, Dan? Tim, rather? They're the same. In a given, they're not the same, when one is neither more nor less in that respect. Now then, if that's what the word equal means, let's come back to the sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are by nature equal, which means that all men are neither more nor less in a certain respect. In what respect is it true? In what one respect, in what one respect, only one, is it true that all human beings are neither more nor less? Right. What? Yeah. Human. That's right, absolutely right. It's the only respect. The statement that all men are equal has only one truth to it, namely, in the respect of their common humanity, as being all members of the same species, all human, Neither, no, no one more or less human, they're all equal, right? Right. So we've got a self-evident truth here. How about the next one? That they're endowed by their nature with certain unalienable rights. Leaving aside the question of self-evidence there, I want to know uh, two things. If, there, if, the rights that, if the rights that Jefferson <coughs> calls unalienable are rights that m human beings have endowed in their nature, are unalienable rights the same as natural rights? Are unalienable rights the same as natural rights? Are these three phrases synonymous? Unalienable, listen carefully, unalienable rights, natural rights, and human rights. Well, they all, are, those, are those three names for the same thing? Unalienable rights, people and human are the same? Sure, because it's human nature, right? Yes. So we've got three names now for what Jefferson told me. Unalienable rights, natural rights, human rights. Next question. What does the word unalienable mean, uh, Greg? That, um, what does the word unalienable mean? They can't be taken away. Right. You all agree with what Greg just said? What is unalienable? That's exactly what the word, uh, what is alienable can be taken away. Now that you've answered that question, I'm going to put you on the spot. Ready? <clears throat> Among these rights, says Jefferson, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want to take liberty for a moment. And let's say for a moment that uh, just quickly, the word liberty means being able to do as you please. 
a man commits a crime, is justly tried, justly convicted, and justly sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. Would you say that when we imprison this justly condemned and sentenced criminal, we are taking away his liberty? Yes. Then the liberty, then Jefferson is wrong, then the liberty is not unalienable. That's correct. Mm -hmm. You think that, so? Well, oh. Yes, yes, yes? <coughs> are you opening your mouth? Uh, <laughs> I was about to, but no. Well, well, keep on opening. Wait, well, you said, all right, you said that the man is like thrown away. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, we, uh, Greg helped us by saying unalienable means a right that can't be taken away. So I gave I, him an example. We take a, a man who's a criminal, try him justly, sentence him justly to 20 years in prison. We obviously have taken away his liberty, have we not? Yeah, but he's... But he's, ta he's, given, he's, ta he's taken away somebody else's right. And that, I mean, he's, he's broken a law. Yeah, that's correct. And he still taken... leaves the question very difficult to answer. Have we not alienated or taken away what Greg says can't be taken away because it's called an, the right to liberty is, <coughs> is unalienable? We have, but not unjustly. I did not say that, but maybe we've done it justly, but if we do it justly, then it is, it is not no longer an, an unalienable right, correct? It can't be both alienable and unalienable. What do you do about that? Uh, I was going to say he forfeited his liberty. Oh, very interesting indeed. He I'm gave going. his liberty up. Tell me I... about, uh, I, I'm delighted to have you use the word, Duff, uh, Duffy. What do you mean by forfeited? Well, he... Go ahead. I don't know, but he, well, by you, doing you that, you. by doing that, he committed an he evil committed act. He committed a crime. Huh? So, he yeah, so he's putting his liberty on the line by doing that, and he knows that it's, it, maybe it's against somebody's pursuit of happiness. Yeah. So he has given up his right to claim yeah. his liberty. Uh, uh, could right? I, I'll come back to you a moment, David, uh, to Tim. I think um, we need to further qualify unalienable to mean that it can't be taken away by another person. Perhaps the criminal forfeited the liberty himself. Well, that's what, that's what Buffy said. Right. But, now, but the question I want to ask both of you now, all of you listen to this, please, because I want you to come in on this. Uh, both Tim and Buffy have helped us along by saying that unalienable right has been for not taken away so much as forfeited, given up by the criminal, Criminals Act. The next question is, has he given up the right or the exercise of the right? Has he given up the right... Now, before you answer that question, think of the 20 years being over and he comes out of prison. What has been restored when he's released from prison? The right or the exercise of it? Exercise. exercise. So what's taken away is not the right but the exercise. Right. 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 So the right is inalienable. Now then we come to the more difficult question. Uh, Chris, and I hope you'll get help from your colleagues on this because when we sentence, this man has now committed a capital offense. He has killed somebody, murdered, mur committed murder in the first degree. And he lives in a state in which the sentence of first degree murder is electrocution. We take away his life. Do we take away his life or the exercise of his life? Chris, in that case, do we take away his life or the exercise of his life? Take away his life. But in that case, a, there's no, he can't, his life can't be restored, can it? Cannot. Uh, does, this have, does this business, if, if his right to life is unalienable, even though he's forfeited it by his act, isn't the case of capital punishment different from the case of imprisonment? Yes. What, what do you do, uh, if, uh, if I asked you the hard question, suppose I ask you all to tell me, how do you stand on capital punishment, for or against it? How many for? How many against? Uh, why four? Uh, why four? Did you say four? Because if a man takes someone else's life, he deserves to die. Why against? I'm against because if I take your life and then he punishes me by taking my life, he's doing nothing any better than what I was doing. Die Except that you took his life unjustly and he's justly punishing you. He's a, he's a judge. Who is to judge if you consider well, no, yeah. taking some, If you person. consider it just to take someone else's life. Yeah. It seems to me that you're breaking your own rules. Yeah. You can't kill, and then you turn around and kill somebody. I mean, take it uh, apart. Take you it apart. can take somebody's liberty away and give it back, but if you kill no, you, somebody's... What you, give, what you give away, you take away the exercise. Right. 
But you, you can never the take the exercise of a life away. Right. And I'm, I'm for it. So I think, you know, once – I'm for capital punishment. So I think once somebody kills somebody that life imprisonment doesn't Not really ever, you know. Yes. Uh, if we said the right was unalienable, no. then we can't take his life away. So it, mm -hmm. it's wrong. Yeah, but I'm not doing this by the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you see, e either these rights are inalienable or they're not. Uh, Jefferson is saying flatly <coughs> that natural rights and human rights, which are the same thing, are rights that can't be taken away, even justly. And yet, we we've solved the problem, I think, in the case of liberty by saying the right is not taken away, the person by committing the crime has forfeited his exercise of the right, and when his term in prison is over, the exercise of the right is restored. That's easy. The case of capital punishment is more difficult. I'm confused on the definition of right, and if you could just explicate that a little bit more. Uh, I'm glad you asked, and I'm going to postpone the answer for a moment. You certainly have every right to know what the word right means. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, among the, the certain able rights. And the, the, the word right, by the way, occurs twice. Uh, it occurs in the, in the, I want you to notice the two places where it occurs, and it doesn't mean that, uh, but very good to ask the question because the word occurs twice, and in the two occurrences, it has different meanings. You've, you've, you're looking at it where it says there are certain unalienable rights, correct? Among these are. About five lines down, it says when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and abolish it. The question is whether the word right used in that second sentence has the same meaning as the word rights in the first sentence. Follow me? We'll come back to that, if you will, in a moment. But let's stay with leaving the word rights hanging in the air for a moment. But that's a difficult, very difficult word. And it's going to take me a little time to get to it. I have to give you some, be patient. That, that to secure, I, 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 come back. Certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And now I come to the most difficult words of all, the pursuit of happiness. I'm going to ask a very hard question. Do you think the, the right to life and the right to liberty are rights in the same sense, still leaving the word right to be examined, that the right to life and the right to liberty are rights exactly in the same sense as the right to the pursuit of happiness? Or is there a shift in meaning when it goes from life and liberty to the pursuit of happiness? Anyone on that one? Anything? It becomes more precise as you go on down with life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. With liberty, with life comes liberty, comes pursuit of happiness. Pardon me? What did you just say? With life, liber with life comes liberty. With liberty comes the pursuit of happiness. You, what you're saying, if I understand you, uh, Tom, you're saying life and liberty are means to the pursuit of happiness. If you say from them comes, mm -hmm. what the end comes from the means, you're saying the difference there is that in one case, Jefferson is naming an end, the pursuit of happiness, when he talks, when he talks about that, and in the other case, He's naming means to the pursuit of happiness, since no one can pursue happiness without life, and no one can pursue happiness without liberty. So let's take what you're saying, and I'm going to, I think that's a good steer, and I'm going to rewrite the Declaration a little more now. <laughs> By the way, I'm just improving on Jefferson a little bit. I want to expand that sentence. I want to expand that sentence as follows. Uh, all men are endowed with certain unalienable, by nature, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and a number of other things that are means to the pursuit of happiness. Now, before I, that, that are means to the pursuit of happiness, as life is, and liberty is, other things too, the crucial word now is happiness, and the word that goes along with it is pursuit. But first, I must tell you two things. Jefferson, before he wrote the Declaration of Independence, with James Mason, a fellow Virginian, wrote the, uh, the preamble to the Constitution for the state of Virginia. And James Mason, in that draft, said life, liberty, and the pursuit and attainment of happiness. So Jefferson learned from Mason the phrase pursuit and attainment of happiness. And when he came to write the Declaration, 
he dropped the word attainment out and kept the word pursuit. Have you any comment on Jefferson's editorial emendation? Was he right to drop the word? Do you think he was right to drop the word attainment out? And keep why, why tell yes, me? Yes, he definitely was because not everyone attains happiness in life. But everyone has the right to pursue it. Yes, but the right to attain it is more than anyone <laughs> could get. No right. government could secure that right, could they? Right, it's very ideal. They could secure the right. No, they could. A government could secure the right to pursue happiness. It couldn't secure the right to attain it, could they? So Jefferson was. Now the other thing I want to tell you is that this phrase, life, liberty, and is also to be found in a, in a great English writer that Jefferson knew, that many of the phrases of which come into the Declaration. That's John Locke, who in 1768 wrote a book called Second Treatise on Civil Government. And there, John Locke talks about natural, doesn't call them an unalienable, calls them natural rights, which is other life, liberty, and property. Life, liberty, and property. And Jefferson dropped the word property out and put the word pursuit of happiness in its place. So that's a very crucial phrase in our declaration that occurs nowhere else in the world. That requires us to look at the word happiness. Because we can't understand what the, de what the declaration is saying unless we understand what the word happiness means, correct? Uh, Mark, what do you think the word happiness means? When you use the word, when you use the word, I want to be happy, or I was, I have been happy. I'm not happy now, but I was happy yesterday. I was happy last year, but I'm not happy this year. When you say that, what do you mean by use? What, what do you mean by the word? I'm pleased with the way I am at the moment. What, what pleased? What, what makes you pleased? What makes you Everything. pleased? Oh, well, you have to say a little more than that. When are, you, when are you displeased with the way you are? What, what, what gives you displeasure? I fail, of course. What? If I fail, of course. You don't have what you want. One meaning of happiness, which is one you just used, is happiness consists in getting what you want. So that one meaning of happiness, which, by the way, is happiness meaning number one on the left side of that board, happiness one, can, happiness consists in getting what you want. And that's why you can say, today I felt happy, today I'm happy, last week I was very unhappy, I was frustrated, I was dissatisfied, I was discontented, I didn't get what I wanted. Um, and in that meaning of happiness, that's the psychological meaning of happiness, because you either feel pleased or displeased. You said pleased, satisfied, getting what you wanted. Um, what's the other meaning of happiness? What other, what other meaning do you think happiness has? I got happiness uh, one there, happiness getting what you want. Getting what, what you, you need. need. <laughs> that's exactly it. Daryl, tell me. What is the distinction in your mind between wanting and needing? And uh, after you try, I'll make, put everyone on the spot on this one. What do you think the difference between needing something and wanting something is? Need is... They both are desires, aren't they? They're yes. both desires, but they're different kinds of desires. What's the difference between the desire that is a want and the desire that is a need? That one, uh, with a need, it'd be difficult to survive. Without the want, uh, it'd be... Uh, not be enjoyable. Life would not be enjoyable. Yes, Buffy? Here's an example. You have to have food to be happy, to be alive, but you want a steak. You know, you want more than you need. Mm -hmm. You want the better of mm -hmm. something. That's interesting. Very interesting indeed. Uh, let's, follow, let's follow Buffy's lead. Uh, think of the, think of the, yes? A need is necessary. A want is superfluous. Good. Uh, let's go one step further. If I asked you to, if I, t I said to you, I'm not, don't do this, but just think of it a moment. Suppose I said, take a piece of paper and write down on that paper the 10 things you want in the next uh, semester, between now and June. Suppose you did that. And then I said, take another piece of paper and write down on the other piece of paper the things you think everyone needs in the course of a whole lifetime. Would, how would the two lists compare? How about that, uh, Sheila? Your, your wants are um, a whole lot more than what you, than what your needs will be. Oh, yeah. All the wants want lists would be different, but all the need lists would be the same. That's exactly right. Exactly right, Mark. For the most part, they, there might be some slight differences, but as Duff Buffy said, no one would no one would uh, uh, deny that everyone needed food or drink or sleep or some kind of protection against the elements. Those are the simple biological needs or liberty, or knowledge, 
right? Or pleasure. Those are needs. But stakes, yachts, uh, Mercedes Benzes, or even, even good grades are not needed but wanted. Now then, that second meaning of happiness, happiness too, which consists not in getting what you want from day to day, which gives you contentment and pleasure, but getting what you need in the course of a whole lifetime, now follow me now, not today or tomorrow, getting what you need in the course of a whole lifetime is the ethical meaning of happiness. Because when you get what you need, when you get what you need, uh, you have all the real goods, things you need are really good for you. You can't need anything that's not really good for you. You, have, you possess all the real goods that a person uh, should have. Which, do you, which of those two meanings? Meaning one is the psychological meaning, in which you could be happy one day and unhappy another. Meaning two is the ethical meaning, or moral mean, ethical meaning, in which a happy life as a whole is a good, morally good life, made morally good by your having all the things that a human being, every human being needs. Which do you think Jefferson means when he says the pursuit of happiness? Which do you two. What? Two. 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 Clearly, it must be. Why must it? Why must it be two, uh, Tom? Why must it be two? Uh, Sitting there, no Tom. What, what, what is? If someone said, if someone said, no, it's one. How would you argue against him? How would you show he couldn't possibly be right by saying it's the, the first meaning? Yes. Because it'd be impossible for a government to satisfy everyone's wants. Exactly right. So it'd be impossible to do that, because you and I might want conflicting things. Might we want? But I, if I got what I wanted, you could get what you wanted. But there's no conflict in our needs. The government can secure both your needs and my needs, and they're the same. So Jefferson must have meant the ancient meaning of happiness, which is the meaning of a whole good life. And let me take that sentence again. We are endowed with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and anything that any human being needs in order to achieve a morally good life. Now I want to come back to the good question that Darrell asked. You want to know what rights are? Uh, the text doesn't help us on this one. But we've, we've got enough of the discussion now to, to find out. You and I and every other human being has a right to what anyone needs, and has a right to what any human being needs, not what any human being wants, has a right to what any human being needs in order to lead a good life. Natural rights are rooted in natural needs. If there were no natural needs, there'd be no natural rights. Is that clear? Answer your question? Yes. Now then, do you think that's the same meaning of the word rights down a little below when Jefferson says, when a, when a form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Is that a right in the same sense as a natural right? Or does the word right they have a different meaning? It's a different meaning. They, they, they don't have a right in the same sense which a right is based upon a natural need. We don't have any natural need to alter and abolish governments. That's not a need like hunger the hunger and, 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 and drink and need for liberty. But the word right there means it is, it's, it's correct. It's all right. It's, it's justified. You follow the point there? Let me read. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide due guards for their future security. Now, in that sentence, Something new has happened. What, what new word, what new word, Jefferson has said a moment, a little earlier, ten lines up, that when a government doesn't secure the rights of its people, they are justified, they are justified in overthrowing it or altering it. Now he says something different. What does he say different? Duty. Their duty to overthrow You've got the right answer. He said their right and their duty. You are, if I understand this, I imagine yourself going home to your parents and saying, if this government is 
the government of the United States is unjust, I am morally obliged to try to overthrow it. That's what Jefferson's saying, isn't he? What do you think about that? Well, why, in what way are you morally obliged? Morally obliged, your duty, your moral duty to overthrow an unjust government. Yes? Because oh. if it's unjust, then it's breaking your moral rights, so you, but your unalienable rights, so you're morally obliged to overthrow it because very, it's breaking your moral rights. You're very close to it. So, uh, try to, uh, I'll come back to you. Did, did you understand what he said in the first place? Did anyone want to ask him a question about what he means? <coughs> did you understand what Mark said? Say it again, Mark. <laughs> try it again. <laughs> try it again. Okay. If, you, if the government is unjust and it's breaking your... It's, un unjust, it's unjust because it's violating... It, it's your unalienable transgressing your Transgressing your basic human rights, right? Which are your moral rights, so you're morally obliged to overthrow the government. That's very close to being it. Yes, Chris? If, if there's injustice going on by taking away your rights or other people's rights, if you don't oppose it, yes. then you are like an accessory to that injustice. You're giving your consent by not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Almost. Yes. yes. It's hard to violate your needs. Yes. And so you have a, should, in order to survive, do something about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're all very. <coughs> I think everything you've said is, is, is relevant and on the point. There's only one little thing left over, and that is are you morally obliged to try to make a good, morally good life for yourself? Are you morally obliged to seek, to pursue, to pursue happiness in sense two? I mean, you say, I don't want to pursue happiness. Are, are you under a, a deep moral obligation to pursue happiness in sense two on the boards over here, where happiness means trying to lead as morally as good a life as you can? Are you morally obliged to do that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now then, if in order to do that, you have certain needs, rights you need, rights to certain things that you need to lead a morally good life, and if an unjust government transgresses or violates those needs, you can't perform your moral duty, can you? Hence, if you have a duty to lead a good life, you have a duty to overthrow the government that interferes with your leading a good life. That, that amounts to what you're saying. I'm not adding very much. Like, have I added anything to what you said? I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you all are... So that in some sense, we only are justified in being rebellious against an unjust government, but we are also morally obliged to be rebellious against an unjust government. That's a very strong doctrine. Any questions about this so far? And so we come finally to the last paragraph. I would like to know whether you think the la this is a hard point. Whether you think the last paragraph, uh, which begins with the words, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, would that be more accurately printed if the words United States were written with small u and a small s? Or do you think there's some error being committed by having that written with a large U and a large S. Is my question clear, Teresa? What do you think? I think, now that I've been thinking about it, um, I think it should be a small U and a small S, Why? lowercase. Because um, later in that paragraph, he says, um, yes. and that, it just, a portion of it says, and that as free and independent states. Because the United States, they were not united. united. They were not united. They had each their own That's currency. Right. Were, I think maybe he meant that they were all united in breaking away from they were, they were united in the war. That was okay. the only thing yeah. that they were united That's why, in. that's why I had to put it in lowercase. Mm -hmm. They were united. They were states, but they weren't the United States. See, the phrase United States of America is the name of one nation in which the states are only parts. Yeah. Now, let me ask one further question. Uh, in 1861, Jefferson Davis, uh, the president of the Southern Confederacy, and the other Southern states seceded from the Federal Union, correct? Mm -hmm. That was the act of secession that brought on what we call the Civil War. I want you to think about this moment. Could Je if, if Jefferson Davis did, did do, didn't do this, but if he had wanted to, could Jefferson Davis have taken 
the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which you said led to the War of Secession, and used the first paragraph, exactly as written, to declare the secession of the southern states from the North, from the Federal Union. Could he have used exactly the same words that Jefferson used for the secession of the 13 colonies from Great Britain for the secession of the southern states from the Federal Union? Yes, Chris. I think they could have. Yes, Doug. They weren't suffering any real injustices, being in the, only that they couldn't have slaves. No, that's not that. That was a took away lots of other rights, voting rights from when, Congress. Well, that was the main when reason. When America why was, it? was separating from Great, Great Britain, Britain, there was one government over another country, but when the state pulled apart from the other states, it was one government, so you couldn't use the same. In other words, there's a difference between the two secessions. Uh, right. In one case, colonies was seceding from, or seeking their independence of an imperial power, which was Great Britain, the, the Great British Empire, correct? In the case of the southern states, they were equal with the northern states in the Federal Union. They were states separating themselves from other states in the same Federal Union. But wouldn't the words almost apply, though? Wouldn't those words almost apply for Jefferson Davis, Mark? No? Uh, I, th I think so. I don't think you'd have to change one word. I guess it doesn't say anything it. about no? having another, like another government. I think, I, 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 in my opinion, Jefferson Davis could have used those words uh, uh, for the secession of the southern states. This is an extraordinary document. I hope you'll read it again. And in those, in those lines we read carefully this afternoon are the fundamental principles of American political life. This, more than even the Constitution states, the ideals, the basic ideas that make America what it is. The seminar you just witnessed on the Declaration of Independence is not a typical seminar. It's a very special one because it's a very special document, quite different from the reading of books or chapters in books, and because the concentration here in this particular seminar is really a word-by-word -word examination of a few lines, which is not what happens in most seminars. But the purpose of that, this seminar is really to get future citizens to understand, I think, the, the single great document in American history, the document that lays down the principles of our constitutional government, that every American citizen should have read, studied, and understood carefully in order to be a citizen. And that we are not doing, obviously. Yet. Also, in the very short time, he didn't do it perfectly, but we did, I think, come to a fairly good understanding of some basic notions in this text, and I thought they were very good indeed in making that distinction between the right and the exercise of the right, and what unalienable was, and what they had to say about capital punishment. They were very good, even though the diagram on the board helped them on needs and wants, nevertheless, <laughs> they were very good on needs and wants when that came, came, came to the front. So I think they did extremely well in, uh, in handling a difficult text on a word-by-word -word and line-by-line -line basis, which is the purpose of this particular seminar, and is not duplicated in any other case. The second thing I want you to observe is how, in my judgment, poorly geometry is taught today. They've all taken courses in geometry, and not one of them knew what an axiom or a postulate was. That, that is not their fault. It's the fault of the textbooks they use, which don't represent geometry as it should be taught, now connected with other parts of mathematics. But the, the, the advantage, see, if you, introduced, if you introduced great book seminars into your schools at some point in the junior or senior year, you'd have them read the first book of Euclid, which is, which is the beginning of the principles of geometry. And it's a highly discussable book, all kinds of questions to ask about the axioms and the postulates and the demonstrations, the constructions, and so forth. And they'd understand something about mathematics they would never understand from a mathematics class, I assure you. But it was perfectly obvious that the basic notions of, of axiom and postulate were not within their range at all. Have you any questions? It's an observation. One of the youngsters in that group who did not answer the question uh, is an excellent mathematician. Yeah place third in the state. Yeah. <clears throat> state math contest. Uh, certainly demonstrates yeah. your point. Yeah. 
if, if I can say something yeah. as a geometry teacher, yeah. um, <laughs> um, they have geometry in the tenth grade, yeah. and I think that the the need for us to cover a substantial amount of material sometimes does not give us the time to do the things that we would really like to do mm -hmm. in a geometry classroom and therefore by the time they are in 12th grade I'm also teaching an advanced mathematics class yeah. now with 12th graders yeah. that I know those students had this material when they were in a 10th grade geometry class yeah. but I almost have to teach it all over again yeah. so, isn't there something wrong about that don't you think? It's frustrating, yes. Well, it seems to me it's almost pointless. The, the, the whole point of studying geometry is not uh, to carry around you for the rest of your life uh, the demonstrations that you can do on examination, but to know what a demonstration is, to know how a postulate, a definition, and, a, and an axiom works in a demonstration. And, it, and what the, those, In other words, to understand the essence of the mathematical method. That's, what you, that's what's good for the mind. You see, and that, is, that, that seems to be not what's happened as a result of studying geometry. They learn particular demonstrations, they can solve problems, but that isn't very important because they'll forget those very quickly. And logic has been taken out of geometry, oh, completely. which is oh, unfortunate. I know. It, 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 geometry was, a, was a, a model piece of logic for them to learn, you see. Question? Do you think computers can help take care of some of the basics that, like, reinforce? Well, the computers will never do what I, what I want done. The right. computers will be very helpful on the coaching side. That would eliminate us from having to teach so many basics. Uh, if, if the computers took over the coaching of the rudimentary mathematical skills, it would leave the mathematics teacher the time to talk about what's essentially important, what mathematical thinking is. I mean, uh, what you ought to get from mathematics is the models of thinking that mathematics, it's, it's, it's the great, the great, most beautiful ex 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 exhibition of how the human mind can work with rigor. I mean, nothing is as rigorous as mathematics. And to have a taste of that rigor and understand what that rigor is, is one of the great advantages of studying mathematics, which is lost if it isn't done, you see. I was pleased to see today that once you instructed the students that you were going to almost read it word for word, yes. that they warmed to that approach fairly yes. quickly and did um, a fairly good job I with, with truth yeah. and, and equal and they unequal. Tried, tried. Um, and that's encouraging yeah. to see as a history teacher. I think so too. Having dealt with this the, document. As, as too infrequently done. Uh, I, I would wager that in, in hardly very few classrooms is that word-by-word -word approach to a difficult text made. But they did it today. They did, did today, yes. I wanted to ask you something with regard with that, and I, I found myself a little bit frustrated because I felt that you had a very focused idea of what you wanted to do and were making judgments about what to spend no time on. No question about that in, that in this case, because in this case, uh, my aim was to have these ten lines well understood. Uh, it wasn't an open discussion in the sense of anything goes. I wanted to be sure that every crucial word in that text, which is so essential, was examined and understood as well as it could be understood. And I think that happened. If they didn't understand something, I'd say, well, I'd force them to try to understand it right then and there. In other words, I'd follow it up. The seminar would not be enough. I'd, I'd go through a written exercise and an oral exercise with them, because what I want to do here is to have them understand something they didn't understand before. I thought, I thought there were a couple of points where, where that would be useful. I, the one that I was struck by particularly was this question of created, yeah. and one of the students did come back to it and That's say right. why, and you said that you felt that that was part of the rhetoric of the time. Yeah. You made a judgment that that word well, wasn't worth dealing with in well, this particular I, 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 context. The only and point about it is not that it's false, but that it removes, it doesn't enable, it, it stops Jefferson <coughs> from saying it's self-evident. Because whatever can be doubted is not self-evident. And God's existence can be and has been doubted. And that men are created, not evolved, has been doubted, you see. And so I just want to call attention to the fact, not that it's false, but not self-evident. Follow me? Mm -hmm. And that's very important to understand. It's important to understand there, there are only a very, I would guess there are probably not even two dozen in the whole range of human learning 
There are not even two dozen self-evident truths. Many of them are in mathematics, as a matter of fact. Most of them are in mathematics, but there are some in moral philosophy, some in metaphysics. Um, I'll give you a metaphysical self-evident truth, namely, uh, only the actual acts, which I mean, a possible rain shower can't wet you. Only an actual one. <laughs> it's very simple, isn't it? But it's self-evident. There are a few like that, but not many. And it's important to recognize them, you see. And by the way, they, they all saw quickly that triangle one, didn't they? Yes. Got it at once. It's very, very important to have them get that as a model, because they often say that's self-evident when it isn't self-evident, as Jefferson did himself. I think one of the things that's intriguing about a seminar is that the director has to, at some level, be satisfied that thoughts are incompletely learned. Oh, sure. For example, oh. the, the issue of the exercise of liberty as opposed to liberty. Mm -hmm. um, right to you know, I didn't feel that I understood it. I wasn't sure that a fair number of students understood it. And, and how do you as a seminar director decide, we understand it enough to go on, we understand it enough that it will come up later in their lives, or I, I need to stop and go on with I this? I don't know the answer to that question. It's pragmatic. You have two hours or some part of two hours. and you, if you really pushed any one of those points for all it's worth, it would take much more than two hours to do it, you see. So what you've done is to start, you've started them thinking about that distinction, <coughs> the right and the exercise of it. Well, that will grow. It'll come up in other cases. If you stayed with that to push it to its full, for the full measure of its understanding, you would, I think, not, not get through all the points you wanted to cover, you see. I, you, and you can take a, take a choice. You could do it either way. You could also follow up, though, couldn't you? Sure you could. Next day. Sure you could. With, with some issue that was particularly bony uh, well, through a deductive lecture. Let's even. suppose for a moment, I'll show you how that would happen. Suppose that, that I, you got the paper, papers in that I asked you to ask them to write. And all of them mentioned the distinction between the right and the exercise of the right. Then you call the a student in and say, that's a very nice paper. Tell me. Let me hear again, how do you understand that distinction? Then you'd have a chance to push it as far as you can go, you see? So you, you haven't given up on it, you see? Particularly if you connect the seminar with a piece of writing and an oral interrogation. The seminar by itself is not enough. It's only going to happen once a week, but it should be connected with the, the, the coaching exercises that involve uh, writing and speaking and answering questions and so forth. Is that clear? Having had the session today and recognizing those youngsters who participated, uh, will you go into your next session uh, keeping in mind those youngsters who did not participate? Oh, yes. Is there a game plan? Yes, to I will. Uh, as today, I did not make the effort, as I will make on later occasions this week, uh, to get everybody in. Today, there was no opportunity to ask a question that went around the room and got everybody in. Other, other books, other discussions will present that opportunity. So today is, I, I, as I think I said, a very special exercise that is very important to do because of the character of the document and because every future citizen should it's have that understanding. Point. My aim is to get a, a, a better understanding of these crucial sentences in the Declaration. I think we did that in part. That's the outcome.